Good morning, and welcome to Abington Presbyterian's worship service. We are so happy that you have um, decided to join us on YouTube. You could have picked any other place, but you picked us, so that's really, really good. And so we're happy that you're here with us this morning. This Sunday, May 24th, our worship service will focus on what Jesus prays that his followers might have, unity. Scripture lessons will be Acts 1, 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and John 16, 32 through 17, 11. During this service, we will be celebrating those who are the newest members of the APC family. And there will be special music, and you've just heard some of it. The Hoyles just played a beautiful bassoon piece. You heard it. It was good. We had a great first session of a meditative journaling and creative prayer class this past Wednesday. About 25 people participated in the first session. If you want to get in on the remaining parts of this five-week offering that meets from 3 to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays, please contact John Saul via the website. We want to celebrate those from APC who are graduating from high school college or graduate school, please send such information to Aaron Twitchell via the webpage. With growing unemployment, food pantries are needing contributions to help supply the need for those who are hungry. The session just voted to make a substantial gift to our partners in ministry, the Interfaith Food Cupboard, located at 1250 Eastern Road in Roslyn. We encourage you to donate canned goods to this ministry, which is located just behind Living Word Lutheran Church. Sunday, May 31st, will be Pentecost Sunday. On that day, you will be invited to a virtual fancy fellowship at 11 a.m. Bring your own coffee, BYOC. At this fellowship time, you will get to see the youth members of our confirmation class who will have joined APC earlier this, that morning. There will also be a time for you to get to know your new minister of congregational care. That would be me. And there is a link about this event coming on the webpage. There are also plans in the works for a virtual communion service on Sunday, June 7th. More information will be coming forth. Just remember, we are one in heart and mind with you as we serve our Lord. Let us call one another to worship. Our human scene has received a visit from the eternal. God's realm comes into our history to revamp all our possibilities. The risen one is lifted in God's glory and we are moved to worship. Even as our congregations physically stand separated, we seek to be united in expressing our praise. God's spirit empowers us to share the love of God with all people.
Let us now confess our sins in the, uh, the prayer of confession. Ruler of heaven and earth, we confess that we would like to regulate your timetables and shape your plans. We prefer our ways to the unknown design of your realm and purposes. Even though you have given us new life now and eternal life to come, we still show that we are afraid to follow in your ways. Our priorities are shaped by our selfishness. Our goals deviate from your commandment for us to be defined by love. Forgive our pretensions and restore us to right relationships with you and all your people. The way has been opened for us to live into God's gracious reign. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I want you to know about something that happened for the absolute first time in our 306 year history as a congregation. We have new members who joined the church in a virtual session meeting. It's not the first virtual session meeting we've had, but this was the first time that we've had members join in that way this past Wednesday night. We celebrate our newest members this day. David and Sandy Bishop, Michael Kemp and Janet Easley, and Kate Zarnecki. There's information about each of them in today's bulletin. Also at this time when we cannot yet gather to baptize infants but look forward to doing so, we still celebrate their entrance into our church's family. We rejoice in the birth of Kate and Walker, Walter Sarnecki's son, William Casimir Kaz Sarnecki, who was born April 30th. We also give thanks to God for the birth of Amanda and Joe Pompili's son, Joseph Walker Pompili, May 17th. Let us lift up our welcoming hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks for the newest members of Abaddon Presbyterian Church. We celebrate your gracious welcome, which we seek to emulate. Enable our newest members to grow in their faith as followers of Jesus Christ as part of this congregation. Use each of them to increase the ministry of love and justice that is based here. Pour out your spirit upon David, Sandy, Michael, Janet, and Kate. We also give thanks for the safe arrival of William Casimir Sarnecki and Joseph Walker Pompili. 
We know you delight in the littlest ones among us even more than their new parents do. Give rest, strength, and gentleness to Kate and Walter, to Amanda and Joe as they seek to nurture their young sons, as they long to demonstrate God's loving embrace in their own. And bless us as a congregation as we seek to give care and support to each of these people who are now a part of us. With grateful and joyful hearts, we make this our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to invite the children who are watching to join me. If that means coming closer or just looking up from the children's bulletin, do so. You just heard that we have some wonderful news happening around here. Even while we are separated, even while we are not in this building, our congregation is still vibrant and active, and we have new little babies being born. It's exciting to hear about Kaz and Joey. And we look forward to meeting them, and they will be bigger, and it will be so great. It's been a week of a lot of different changes. I had the privilege to be part of the nursery school's drive-up kind of conclusion to the year. Each class had an hour where they could come in their cars with their masks on, and their teachers and myself were spread out in the parking lot and they had the things for those children that we just didn't know we should have sent home months ago. The circle spot, their name tag, their star of the day special that they wear, some artwork. There were even, um, I think it was shamrocks were mostly the artwork that was going home because the last time we were here in the preschool at the church was in March. And then there were little gifts, things to remind them of their teachers, books to read a little bit over the summer, and just some special things so that they knew how much their teachers were thinking of them. And it was wonderful and joyous for them to come and see the building. More than one child, more than a few children wanted to get out of the car and come right in and have class. And that was a little bit of a sadness. But it was so joyful for them, even with the mask on, to see their teachers. Few of the little threes, we had to kind of peek our faces so they knew just who we were, because those masks are pretty great, and they weren't so sure who was behind them. There was, though, one little girl named Luna, who was in line, and she talked with her teachers, and I saw her before she got up to the teacher area, and we sang a song or two and talked about Monkeys Jumping on the Bed, one of our favorite songs in music. And I saw as Luna's parents were getting ready to go, Luna piped up and said, but where is the party? And her parents said, oh, this is the party, Luna. And Luna knows that sitting in a car talking to someone out the window is not a party. And her face fell and her eyes got a little teary. I think that she had been so excited about this moment to come see her teachers and be at her wonderful preschool, this place that Abington Presbyterian Church, Abington Presbyterian Nursery School has provided for 60 years in this community, that the thought of a party without everybody else did not really feel like a party. I know she was okay once she got home, but I was feeling a little like Luna. It is the 60th anniversary of our nursery school. For 60 years, this community has blessed the neighborhood, children, families, people from all walks of life with a vibrant and wonderful place to bring their children. And I have met a lot of you through preschool. Because not only do I get to work with singers in kindergarten through sixth grade, but I also became the nursery school music teacher about 11 years ago and I have loved that connection. In fact, some of you came to start coming on Sundays because you loved how much fun it was to be here during the week. So we thank our nursery school for those visionaries over 60 years ago who started that program, for the people within the church who said this is important to us and our ministry to the community, for the director who's celebrating her 30th year, Mrs. Foy. I bet a lot of you have met Mrs. Foy. She's something else. 
for all the teachers who have been here, and especially for all the children and the families. What a wonderful way for us to remember that even though we can't have a party together, Luna, we are celebrating joyfulness in this community through vision and love towards children. Let's say a prayer. God, you give us so many ways to learn about you, and we are ever grateful for those who teach us. Thank you for giving the gifts of patience and kindness, love and joyfulness with children to those who teach and love to be around the little ones. We are so blessed by your gifts. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Grant us, O Lord, the spirit of wisdom and insight, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, to make us quick in understanding and true in judgment, according to the example of Christ, by his grace. Amen. I will be reading Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, the New International Version. These scriptures tell how the apostles were of one mind, praying together with women, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. These are the only words Jesus speaks in Acts, so they are of special significance. Jesus begins the dialogue by instructing the disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the promise from God that is the gift of the Holy Spirit, foreshadowed early in the Gospel of Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he had taken up before their very eyes. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, has, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. They were all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This 
Before I share our other scripture reading, uh, which is about Jesus praying for his followers, uh, let me just mention that uh, within the last week, our large labyrinth, uh, which is on our lower parking lot, got repainted, renewed for use for you to come. Uh, many like to pray as they walk the labyrinth. And um, I invite you to do so, particularly during this time, uh, to do so with just one other or do it, walking that labyrinth by yourself so that it can be done safely. Our reading comes from the end of the 16th chapter of John, the beginning of the 17th chapter. The setting is the upper room. It is the night before Jesus would be killed and he is sharing last things with his disciples. And we hear him say this and then enter into prayer for them. The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world. But they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A number of years ago, there was a bit of a fad to have a colorful bracelet with the initials WWJD embroidered on it. Perhaps some of you may still have one. The acronym stands for What Would Jesus Do? That's not always easy to answer, but it is an appropriate question for followers of Jesus to ask, even though we can't do all that he did. Today's scripture reading from the Gospel of John got me thinking about a bracelet that might have WWJP on it. What would Jesus pray? Prayer, after all, was a central part of Jesus' life. The Gospel accounts indicate that he prayed for many different things. He prayed for people to be healed. He prayed for God's reign to come on earth. In the Garden of Gethsemane, later on the night from our scripture reading, he asked that the suffering that was before him might pass but he also prayed for God's will to be done. He prayed from the cross, asking forgiveness for those who were crucifying him and later commending his spirit 
into God's hands. And surely the most familiar prayer he prayed is the one we will say later in the service, which we call the Lord's Prayer. Through what Jesus prayed and what he taught about prayer, we can understand the gift of prayer as a chance to open our lives to the fullness of God's hopes, promises, and care. It is often easier to give in to despair of how things are than to believe that God offers another way. At times we might be inclined to think that God doesn't listen to us when we lift up our hearts in prayer. But Jesus, by his praying, indicates otherwise. The scripture reading that I shared was just a portion of the longest prayer Jesus utters in any of the gospel accounts. It comes at the end of what is referred to in John as our Lord's farewell discourse. On that Thursday night on which he got betrayed, Jesus knows he is about to die. In the context of his Last Supper with his followers, he prepares them for the time when he would no longer be physically present with them. He washes their feet and challenges them to serve one another. He instructs them to love each other even as he had loved them. He teaches them about the Holy Spirit's pending arrival to be with them and assures them that they would still be able to abide in him. But the last thing Jesus does that evening to prepare his disciples for his departure is to pray for them. He hopes enough, imagines enough, dares enough to lift up the needs of his followers to God. And at the top of the list of those needs would be for his followers to have a sense of unity in the same way he was unified with God. He knew all of his followers would need God's help for that unity to come about, so he lifts up his heart through this request in prayer. Certainly a group of people can gain unity by recognizing that they have a common threat or enemy. People of the United States lived in significant unity in response to the coronavirus when we were first told about the need for social distancing and other mitigation efforts. There was a high level of acceptance of the public health guidelines. But when an economic collapse came as a second threat, some of our society's unity was challenged. And it did not help that some folks felt like it was to their advantage that the American people not be unified during this time of crisis. However, Christian unity, as Jesus talks about it, is not achieved through being focused just on a common threat. Rather, our unity is based on a reflection of the relationship between God and Jesus. He prayed that his followers would be one even as he and God are one. That is a oneness built on a foundation of love and trust. This kind of unity lived out in the church does not mean that we will always agree on everything and that there will be no conflicts along the way. We have had and will continue to have spirited dialogue about our beliefs and practices. But as we listen to Jesus pray, and as we affirm that he continues to pray for us, we are reminded that the quality of our life together, our ability to make visible the unique relationship that exists by God's grace among us is compelling testimony to the truth and power of the gospel we proclaim. I do not know just when it will be that we might be able to have in-person worship services again. It sounds like we're moving closer to that time. 
But when we do, there will still be a need for deliberate care taken so that the coronavirus is not spread by our coming together. Some of our worship and fellowship and education practices will need to be different than they have been. Going through that transition might challenge our typical sense of unity here. But if we are mindful, not only of a common threat, but also of reflecting God's love and maintaining a relationship of trust that guides our behavior, then we are likely to continue to see Jesus' prayer for our unity answered in our midst. The great anthropologist Margaret Mead was born in Philadelphia and was raised just out in Doylestown. Someone once asked her what she considered to be the first evidence of human civilization. The response that was anticipated were some ancient fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones that had been unearthed somewhere. Instead, Mead answered that the earliest evidence of civilization was a human thigh bone with a healed fracture that had been found in an archaeological dig 15,000 years old. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger, get to the river to drink or hunt for food. No animal on its own survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. Mead pointed out that for a person to survive a broken femur, the individual had to have been cared for long enough for that bone to heal. Others must have provided shelter, protection, food, and drink over an extended period of time for this kind of healing to be possible. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. God made us as fragile creatures but also made us with a capacity for compassionate care that goes beyond mere civility toward a shared unity. Without reflecting love and compassion of the God we seek to worship, we can't be a true worshiping community. We will come together in spirit before we do so physically but we come together in ways that show awareness of our common fragility, combined with uncommon love and compassion so we can move toward common unity as we exhibit what is the basis of the word for community. We move toward this greater unity as we show compassion not only internally toward one another, but in extended it beyond our congregation to the larger community and, be and beyond. That guides us in our worship and service life as part of the church of Jesus Christ. WWJP, we have a pretty good indication of what Jesus would and does pray for regarding his followers. Yes, he physically had to leave his followers, but he does not leave us alone. We'll hear more about that next week on Pentecost Sunday. Yet for today, we remember that Jesus prays for us, and we are called to be praying and working for the things our Lord is praying for. We have the chance to open our lives to the fullness of God's hopes and promises and care. And can you imagine that based on how we care about and for one another, even as we work through various controversies, then with God's help, we will be a part of the answer to Jesus' prayer.
Thanks be unto God. Amen. Now please join us as we affirm our faith using the words to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Let us pray. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, O God. We long for the comfort of your presence in this time and in every time. You alone can bring us back from the brink. We reach out for you day after day, hour after hour. Draw near to us so that we may come near to you, O God, our King. We pray this day for a special group of brave people that nobody wants to be a part of. For this is the weekend we honor and remember those in our armed forces who have died while in combat. May you continue to minister to their families and descendants, carrying the legacy of their names unto generations to come. Lord, you hate war. Woe to the nation that declares war in haste. Woe to the people who celebrate the deaths of God's children in this country and anywhere. Help us, O oh God, to do everything in our power to avoid the violence and death that war brings. And when our human capabilities are not enough, we ask that you would intervene into our lives to preserve peace. But in all these prayers and supplications, we lift up those in our congregation, in our city, and in our country who have paid the ultimate price. May we remember them as you remember them. God, as states look to reopen in some way, many of us remain apprehensive, nervous, and scared. Our livelihoods have been deeply challenged. Our mental and emotional health have been strained. Our physical health has been depleted. And so we are eager to return to our way of life in some way. Help us to do so safely and wisely. Help us not to put others at risk for our own satisfaction. And let us not forget what this uninvited Sabbath pause has taught us. For in the midst of the turmoil and disruption, children spent more time with their parents, families slowed down their pace, commitments were reevaluated. That which we thought was necessary became negotiable. And so help us, O oh God, to discern which of these changes might lead us back to a simpler life of devotion to you. And we continue to pray for all those who put themselves at risk in harm's way for our well-being. Doctors, nurses, truck drivers, bakers, car mechanics, counselors and therapists, landscapers, delivery people, bankers, and clerks of all kinds. Protect them all, O oh Lord, and all of us. God, we are grateful for this church. We are grateful for the nursery school, for Barb and the teachers. We are grateful for our ministry and music staff who have been working hard to continue our ministries. We are grateful for our office staff building folks, volunteers, deacons, committee and council members, and all who have committed to furthering the work of your kingdom in this time. Bless each of them and their families. Lord, we continue to pray for your guidance and wisdom. Help us to seek you in prayer. Help us to call on you and to find you when we seek you with all of our hearts. Help us to grow in our faith by reading and studying the scriptures, prayer and service to one another. All of these things were taught to us by the life of your son, Jesus Christ, whose resurrection from the dead we continue to declare in this season of Eastertide, and whose prayer we say along with him as he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you heard Pastor Jade mention earlier in the service, our session voted to provide a gift to the interfaith food cupboard. And it's choices like that made by the leadership of our congregation that make me really proud and grateful to be a part of this congregation because ministries like the Interfaith Food Cupboard need our help in this time, maybe more than ever. And so I'm grateful for our leadership and all of our, uh, uh, all of our members and their families who have continued to give tithes and offerings and gifts to us so that we can continue our ministries for our church family and for the community and beyond. And so in, at this time in our service, we set aside to prayerfully send in your tithes and offerings as you are able so that we might put that to work for God's kingdom. You may do so through U.S. Postal Service and send to the church's address. You may also head to our website and use our online giving portal, which has been open for some time now. We thank you for your gifts, for prayerfully discerning what you are still able to give to this church, and we are thankful to God. Thank you. 